I'm going to talk about numerical simulations and uh, talk to, to Asif and he advised me to split it into two parts. So we'll take a Q&A uh, after part one, which is sort of the basic concepts of, uh, of uh, numerical simulations. I'll give an overview of different approaches. I'll talk about Simpson. And then I'll also talk about uh, about what we have identified as as a increased need to consider how we store our scientific data. Uh, and then in part two, I'll talk about uh, uh, a relatively new uh, software that we are working on, EasyNMR, and then uh, different other uh, examples. So. Uh, the overview, uh, and, and actually I should say my motivation for, uh, for working with numerical simulations is that uh, during, uh, you know, every day you, you work with complex pulse sequences, or, or to some of you this may not be a complex pulse sequence, but anyway, uh, and we work with the spectra that may sometimes have a surprising uh, appearance. Uh, in this case, uh, on the right hand side, I expected the uh, nice uh, regular uh, symmetric doublets uh, in the FSLG decoupled spectra, but I didn't definitely not see that. Uh, could also be more simple that you just have to fit some data to inversion recovery uh, from inversion recovery experiments. If you work with quadrupole nuclei, for instance, using the CPMG experiment, then you're really uh, uh, facing some challenges because. Uh, Quadrupole nuclei are in general difficult. We also have some uh, people doing imaging. Uh, they like to make uh, uh, pattern selective excitations and so on. Uh, and then in many cases, at least in solid state, we really have to uh, be concerned about the orientation of the different tensorial interactions that we are that we're looking at. So Different uh, different tools are needed to analyze the data in these different cases. So, so up here in the pulse sequence, which is is uh, is a, a relatively simple uh, task, you can use product operators that were developed uh, back in the eighties. And uh, if you work with quadrupole nuclei, the challenge is typically that the, that the Hamiltonian doesn't commute with itself. So. So you need to go through more uh, elaborate calculations. Uh, to make these pattern selective excitations, you typically use optimum control. Uh, down here, it turned out that we didn't have a, a uniform uh, orientation of our sample. So we needed to include what is called mosaic spread. And up here, well, basically, you just have to keep track of all the coordinate transformations that uh, that are required to make the, the correct uh, analysis when you rotate the sample and so on, right? So lots of uh, different uh, overviews and definitely the most busy slide I'm, I'm going to present. Uh, so the solutions come as, uh, in many cases, as numerical simulations, because many of the, the examples that I showed on the previous slide you don't really have analytical solutions for it, so we so we really need uh, numerical simulations in many cases. So I've just taken uh, made a small list here. It's it's not complete, and I apologize to those not mentioned. It's not to be to be mean to them, but uh, we have uh, DM fit, which many of you know. We have Simpson. We have spin evolution, spinach, uh, spin dynamica, and then all of these uh, programs that I haven't. Uh, mentioned and apologies for, for that. So on the left hand side I've tried to group them into the more general purpose uh, simulations and the uh, DM fit is used mainly for standard simulations and it it has its focus on uh, user friendliness so it's it's really easy to use. Uh, the programs on the left hand side you have to uh, accept that there is a steeper learning curve and uh, you know you you pull your hair uh, for quite a while until you get it uh, to behave the way that you want. And I hope to, to uh, make this tutorial, among others, to actually solve some of these problems or to uh, reduce it. I'm going to focus on Simpson because that's, uh, that's where my expertise is. But in principle, I could have chosen any of these programs. 
Okay, so uh, yeah, we use numerical simulations to understand pulse sequences, to fit experimental spectra, and and maybe to optimize experimental parameters. In many cases, it's actually uh, a good advantage to uh, try to implement the the pulse sequence. Uh, in well, to well, I say implement, simulate the, the pulse sequence. Uh, on the computer first, because then you know, uh, then you learn about which parameters are important when you when you're going to optimize the pulse sequence later. Uh, in all cases, we'll solve. Uh, well, in this case, it's the uh, Liouville von Neumann equation, which is uh, the the equation of motion of our of our quantum system. Uh, it could also be. So this is in Hilbert space. It could also be in Liouville space. Uh, I'll just address that. Uh, briefly. So we can solve the Liouville von Neumann equation and uh, and we can use this to propagate so from our start operator to to know the density operator at any time uh, using you know normal propagator formalism. In in many cases we have a time dependent Hamiltonian so uh, we cheat and make it piecewise time independent, even though it may be a continuous function. But in most cases, uh, in numerical simulations, they are based on the fact that we slice up the, the Hamiltonian, thereby assuming that it's a piecewise constant. And as you all know, it's, uh, it's the Dyson time operator here that uh, creates all the problems in, in solid state NMR or in, in NMR in general, because it uh, this is uh, the operator that enforces uh, that you that you keep the right order of non-commuting matrices that you multiply by each other. So, so it's a bit challenging, and that's that's also why it's nice to have programs that that does all the all the tedious stuff for you. Uh, so, if you go into Liouville space, then Ilya Kuprov, as uh, that many of you know, uh, presented this paper some. 13 years ago, uh, saying that uh, instead of the normal exponential growth of the matrix sizes in, in spin dynamic simulations, you could actually make a polynomial scaling uh, by reducing the Liouville space. And that's actually a very, very nice idea. Uh, and it works in many cases and, and actually allows you to increase the spin system size because if, if we do a full either Liouville or Hilbert space simulation, we are normally limited to say up to up to around 20 spins or so, and uh, in some cases you might want to simulate 50 spins. So that's simply not possible because of the exponential growth. Uh, there have been other uh, suggestions. I really like the work that uh, that uh, Jean Nicolas Dumas and uh, Lyndon Emsley did uh, 10 years ago on uh, low order correlations. So. The, the idea of this is that uh, in Liouville space you can you can count how many spins are involved in the different operators and and then the idea was to limit the number of saying that that uh, even though you have a hundred spin system you don't have uh, important states that actually involve all hundred spins so so that would be limited to to five or six spins or so uh, in these cases, and they actually do a decent job in simulating uh, spin diffusion in this case, as you see. Um, yeah, so uh, to introduce you to Simpson, uh, well, part of it is actually, well, um, a very important part of it is actually structuring the simulation, so identifying the 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 key elements and understanding the key elements of a of a numerical simulation of a of an NMR spectrum or FID, uh, whatever that will be. So you need to specify the spin system. You also need to specify other simulation parameters like magnetic field strength, uh, spin rate if you rotate the sample what uh, is the start and detect operator and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of other parameters that you need to specify in the simulation. Uh, you need to obviously tell what is the pulse sequence 
and then you need to give various instructions like uh, doing the simulations, doing uh, Fourier transforms and uh, add line broadening, et cetera, et cetera. In Simpson, this is all, uh, all instructions are gathered in a Simpson input file, which is just a text file that you, that you edit on your computer. And it has the, the spin system uh, and then we'll, in curly bracket, it has all the instructions that go with the spin system. So uh, you could say it's not, well, you start specifying the number of channels on your spectrometer, the number of uh, the different nuclei. So in this case, we have one nitrogen, 15 and two carbon, 13 nuclei in the spin system. And then we specify the chemical shift and dipole couplings and so on. And if it were quadrupolar nuclei, then you would also specify the quadrupolar coupling. And then even though this is a very old slide uh, down in the parameter section, you see that already back then, uh, I started using this slide back in 2010. At that time, we already had a 1.2 gigahertz spectrometer, virtual spectrometer, obviously. Uh, and then we specify, so apart from specifying the, the LAMA frequency, we also specify start operators and spectral width and so on and so forth. Then we have the pulse sequence and the main. And I like to see it that way, that up here we have the sample in this part of, uh, so these four uh, components of the input file, they describe the sample, they describe the spectrometer, the, the experiment to run. And then we have the NMR operator who sits behind the, the host computer of the spectrometer, instructing to do Fourier transforms and, and start acquisition and so on and so forth. So it's not too bad, is it? Uh, I'll just go through one example here. So uh, one example with a single proton, as you see, and it has an isotropic shift of zero. It has an anisotropic shift, the CSA chemical shift and isotropy of 10 ppm. And then it has an asymmetry parameter and three oil angles. The parameter section would look something like that you specify a crystal file. So you have to specify whether you work on a single crystal or whether you work on a, on a, on a powder sample. And in this case, alpha zero, beta zero, it's just a single crystal uh, sample. I have a spectral width of 10,000 Hertz. I can define variables, number of points. In this case, it's actually a, an even higher alarm frequency and then the start and detect operators, and then which method I use, gamma angles and spin rate and so on. Uh, all of these are instructions that you need to specify uh, in order for it to run. The pulse sequence, oh, I should actually just go back and, and show you that uh, I've specified the start operator to be Ix of nucleus number one, and the detect operator to be I plus of nucleus number one. So actually I start along X instead of starting with set magnetization. That's because if you, if you do the simulation on, on a single proton, it turns out that you can easily make a 90 degree uh, flip. So, so don't waste time on simulating that because it actually, it just works. So, so we'll just start with magnetization along X and then detect I plus. In which case, as you see the pulse sequence, we just start acquiring a point. We don't need the 90 degree pulse first, but we start acquiring. And then we have a loop where we have a delay and then an acquisition again. This is a very intuitive way of implementing, but also a very uh, tedious way, at least for the computer to calculate it because it has to calculate the propagator of the delay every time. And it's actually the same propagator over and over again. So one way to simplify matters would be to just calculate the delay and then store it as propagator number one, and then acquire NP points using propagator number one down here. Or later we added a feature such that you can actually just specify an acquisition block saying that acquisition comes in steps of the dwell time uh, and it uses this repeated block of uh, a delay during it. So this is a very simple and, and very uh, computationally efficient way of doing it. So we'll, we'll do that as uh, in cases where it's possible to do it. The main procedure would typically be that we call this F Simpson command that uh, launches the simulation. So that 
corresponds to running the experiment on the on the on the spectrometer. And then we add line broadening, we save the FID, we zero fill, we Fourier transform, and we save the spectrum. So that would be a, a standard uh, simulation uh, with the normal uh, processing of the spectrum. Okay, so the best practice is that we typically uh, recommend people to use is that it's, uh, it turns out to be hard for most people to start, you know, writing everything from scratch. So it's an advice always to, to download an existing file or to find one of your own existing files and then make gradual changes because that, that works much, much better. Uh, and then find a good text editor with syntax highlighting. It's, it's much easier to, to, uh, to use a good text editor for this. Okay, so uh, recently we published a paper uh, in uh, annual reports it's actually, so it's called Versatile NMR Simulations Using Simpson. It's a, it's a collection of basic simulations using Simpson. Uh, it's actually simulations that I've been using at summer schools for, let's say, more or less the past 10 to 15 years uh, with gradual developments and so on. And uh, and we decided to publish them, to have them in a in a single place. And uh, you can also, uh, yeah, so we have the, all the examples here, all the tutorials, we have, them, uh, we have them online as well, so it's easy to access them. The only thing is that uh, I realized that many people don't have access to annual reports, so uh, if you don't have that, then, well, send me an email and ask for a copy of the paper, and I'll be happy to share it with you. But I'm not allowed to, it's, it's not open access, so I can't unfortunately uh, just publish it uh, open access for everybody. So in the paper, there is a link to this website where, all the, where you can download all the examples. And, uh, and uh, you see there are 15 different examples that you can, that you can try on your own computer. Or actually, it's, uh, it's online, so you just uh, click on one of the examples and you'll see a, a description of the of the example, and then you can go through it. You can uh, you can see the the Simpson input file, which looks like what I showed you on the on the previous transparencies uh, slides, and then you can uh, then you can plot the data directly in the website. So so this is a very easy way to get started, especially if you if you follow the instructions here, uh, then it should be very easy to work through some examples that will make you a Simpson wizard. Uh, one of the things that uh, that became very clear during, uh, well, has become very clear during all all these years, is that I've had uh, close collaborations with Phil Grandinetti. I think he's uh, he's here, and Dipanch, uh, who are who have shared my concern about how do we share data, and also Dominic Machot was involved in this, uh, because actually we all de develop. Uh, uh, different software for simulating data and it was super difficult to uh, communicate and to share the data and and you know it also turns out to be very very difficult to always uh, understand uh, the data that comes out of the spectrometer because there are so many assumptions and uh, and and so on involved in, in understanding the data so uh, so for instance which quantity is used well Normally, if you if you look at a Bruker data set and you get a one R file, you would assume that this uh, presents a process data, so it's probably a it's probably a frequency domain spectrum, right? Except if it's in process number nine nine nine, then it probably comes from a parameter optimization. So then it could be a time if you have scanned a pulse uh, length, or it could be a, uh, uh, an RF power if you scanned uh, a power level and so on. So which means that you don't know what is actually, which quantity is actually represented on the x-axis here. So that's that's the first challenge. Now is the data linearly sampled? Well, you don't really know. Non-uniform sampling, complex or even hyper-complex data, how do you actually store that? Uh, so one of the key questions is how do we, how do we ensure that others can read my data set? I mean, 
I'd like to share the data with, with everybody, but I want them to be able to interpret it in the right way. We have even worse examples in the lead data, like in Greedo, where we sample S and S0, S and S0, S and S0, right? For increasing the number of pulses, that's, uh, that's very difficult to disentangle afterwards if you don't know how it was actually sampled. And then, so we make a lot of uh, implicit uh, assumptions in our data storage. And as a community, we, we know it more or less uh, what kind of assumptions and how to interpret the data. But what happens if we change field? What happens if I want to read an infrared or an ultraviolet or an MS spectrum? Uh, and they have all of the same assumptions and I can't read them anywhere because they're not documented. Then we are really in, in problem. So, and then the last question, how do we share multidimensional data? Let's assume that we have uh, a 3D data set that, that fills uh, 10 gigabyte. How do I share that with my collaborators? Uh, I can't just send them an email with this data set. So, so all of these problems made us uh, think for uh, quite, some, quite some years actually. And uh, so the first analysis was that scientific data has, uh, they are represented by uh, specific dimensions. And dimensions, they can be linearly sampled as a function of a quantity. They can be monotonic, uh, growing or decreasing. Uh, like uh, when you sample inversion recovery, you use typically something like a logarithmic scale or uh, close to that. Or they can be just labeled, just have a name or a tag. And then one important thing that we've been discussing is that quantities have units. I have just made a big argument why this is important. You need to know what kind of quantities you're sampling and what units they, are, they come in. Otherwise, you, you have to tell people if some, well, you have to tell people somehow. The data points that we also like to call the dependent variables, they live on the grid that is expanded by these different dimensions. And the data points, they are not only, uh, you know, it's not just a number, it can be a, a scalar, it can be a complex number, it can be a vector, it, it can be a matrix. For instance, if you use, if you do diffusion tensor imaging, localized spectroscopy and so on, then, then you have vectors and tensors and so on that live on this grid. Uh, and we need to be able to store all of that. And then finally, we also need to take, uh, to be able to handle sparse sampling in a, in a, in a self consistent way. So for this, we ended up developing the core scientific data model where dimensions, they uh, are either linear, monotonic or labeled. You specify a quantity name, you specify for linear dimensions, you specify an increment, and it has a unit if it's, uh, if it's not a dimensionless uh, quantity. And the dependent variables, they have a numeric type, so it could be normal floating point, it could be scalar, a quantity type could be scalar, vector, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then you specify all the data, either just as, as text formatted, which is not very efficient, uh, um, way of storing it, or we can just store it as, uh, as uh, binary data. And one of the really nice things is that instead of storing the components inside the file, we can actually link to the binary chunk of data. So uh, instead of specifying components, we can specify a URL where the link, uh, where the data, binary data lives. So uh, this core scientific data model uses a JSON serialization, uh, it's self-contained because it actually explains, uh, I mean, you don't need, it, there are no assumptions that are not uh, explicitly explained. And then uh, you have the possibility of separating the dimension data from the large data chunk by using this kind of uh, components URLs, which means that you can actually separate, uh, you can actually make much more, uh, uh, much smaller data sets. And this was all published in a paper and, uh, and I sent my acknowledgements to Dipanch and Dominic and Phil Grandinetti who were, uh, it has been a fantastic collaboration doing, doing this development. 
So just one example. Here we take the worst case scenario, a read-all spectrum. And you see that this is all that it takes to, to store a read-all spectrum. Uh, I'll just uh, zoom in so that you can actually see it. We start out with the dimensions. The first dimension is a linear dimension. You recognize that it's frequency domain, so it's the normal frequency axis, right? And then the second dimension is a linear time domain axis. That's, that's where you have the gradual incrementation of, of the number of pulses and thereby the, the, the dwell time in the, in the indirect dimension. And then we have chosen to make two dependent variables. So that's the data. And you see that the two of them, they are called, the name is S and S0. So they're not interleaved. You don't have to worry about how to disentangle them. They come as two separate data sets that live on the same grid. And that's a very simple way of doing it. And then we have the possibility of specifying some extra application, uh, application uh, dependent uh, data information in the file format. So in this case, we have an 8, 8K by 70 complex data points that would take up roughly nine megabytes. But the read or the CSDF, so the core scientific data format file, that takes up only what you see here on the screen. So approximately one kilobyte. So if I want to send the data to you, all of you, I'll just send this one kilobyte. And then when you want to plot it, then your program will download these uh, data files and uh, and uh, and then you you'll download it at that point so it's much easier to share the data in, in this manner and uh, i should say that simpson dm fit and rmn which is the program developed by me uh, dominic Machot, and phil graninetti they're fully compatible with this uh, core scientific data model and uh, I hope that people will start using it because it, it's actually uh, very, very nice to, to be able to provide self-contained data sets. Now, to get help on Simpson and, uh, and so on and so forth, I'd say we have a, we have a discussion forum on the web. Uh, use it. There are people who answer the questions there. Uh, look at the available examples or send an email, but obviously I'd say Sending an email to me means that only I have the possibility of replying. So uh, sending to the group is actually increasing the chances of getting a fast answer. Obviously, I'll be happy to answer questions about Simpson uh, if you have any. And then I advise you to read the papers as well. And uh, as if this was actually the first part of it. So uh, should we take a Q&A now? Uh, yeah. So. If anyone has any question, you can ask, raise your hand and or type in. So there is a, a comment or a question by anonymous attendee. And the question is, I am new in the field and would like to know what's the best software to simulate methyl group rotation. Ah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, actually, I would, uh, huh pass that on to the, to the audience. I don't know what is the best way to simulate it. I know that uh, it's, it's, not completely, it's not completely tedious because it's, uh, yeah, obviously it's changing and they, they are, these methyl group rotations are mainly interesting if, if they're in the intermediate regime. So uh, let's see if there is a, no, there was, that was not a, a question. Uh, that was not an answer to it. So, uh, there is something called the web lab. I don't know what the status of the web lab is, but it's, it's, a, it's a web interface for simulating uh, dynamics. And I think it also have a, has a solid state module. So, uh, web lab could be a, a way, uh, place to go. Mm -hmm. So there is another question by Joseph who wants to know about the file format. Did you consider a more broadly used format or, or did you develop your own? It's a question by Joseph. Yeah. Uh, we, we have been looking into uh, other uh, data formats and, and I think actually 
it's uh, it's in two different uh, hierarchies. Uh, so this is on a more, on a higher level because many of these uh, more advanced data sets they actually work on on storing you know uh, gigabytes of data in the most efficient way. So how how does the hard drive receive and uh, give back the data in the most efficient way? Uh, we have been looking into other uh, we have been looking into other uh, let's say lightweight uh, file formats like JCAMP and so on, but it, it, it they have some other problems. So so we ended up developing our own software, uh, developing our own file format. Yes. All right. So there is another uh, question. Someone wants to know about the speed and accuracy of Simpson compared to other softwares. And also if we can do a parallel computation or use graphical units. You can use, uh, well, you can't use GPUs as it is right now because, uh, well, we need uh, a volunteer to implement it uh, on GPUs. I think uh, so if anyone in the audience is interested in uh, taking up that challenge uh, Simpson is uh, open source so it's uh, very easy to get uh, to get a hand on uh, so speed wise it's let's say comparable to uh, spin evolution uh, I mean I, I think Michael Westhort is in the in the audience here. He might be able to comment on. I haven't made any benchmarking uh, recently, uh, but so it it's in the same order. And uh, yeah, so so I would say that uh, I would say that that speed wise they are compatible. Uh, spinach is a different story. Uh, it's it's difficult. We haven't made any uh, precise uh, uh, comparison. So I would I'd say that uh, given that it's difficult to learn a, a program, you have to you have to find one program that sort of fulfills most of your needs, and then try to try to use that as much as possible. Normally, uh, trying to move to another program and start implementing in a in different language will take much more time than, than the simulation. Okay, so one last uh, question we'll take now. So Joachim wants to ask something. Joachim, go ahead and ask your question. Joachim? Um, I don't have a question. I don't know, it must be a misunderstanding. Oh, sorry. So Thomas, we have some more questions, but I think just to keep on time, uh, we can go with the session and take all of yeah. them in the end. Yeah, okay, that's fine. So uh, concerning these methyl group uh, rotations, I just saw the the chat from uh, Michael Westhort that uh, you, could un you can also look at spin evolution to, to do methyl group rotations. That should be correct, right, Michael? Good. So the second part here is uh, is something different. Uh, now I showed you some of these uh, flow-based layouts in the, uh, when I when I showed the uh, online version of the Simpson simulations, and uh, this is actually something we have been uh, uh, we think we have a we think we are going to have a very very interesting platform here soon. Uh, it takes some time to develop it, so. So it's still uh, in progress, but but actually, uh, I think it's interesting. So let me let me give you some examples. So uh, the idea is that that in many cases we use the same operations over and over again, like a Fourier transform and so on and so forth. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with an MR pipe, which is exactly based on that idea that you. That you, but that's for NMR processing. That you actually pipe your data th uh, from one operation to the next operation to the next operation again. So uh, we have taken that the same idea here and defined what we call flow objects. And these objects, they are just uh, they're just a graphics uh, to remind us what is the function of the object. And then it has these anchor points that either 
feed in data or they can also uh, send data out of the object. In this case, it's just a plot object. So that will receive data, but doesn't uh, uh, send the data any further. It doesn't do anything except plotting the data. Uh, this object that by itself doesn't doesn't do much. The uh, the actual function lies in in a window. So each object has a window, and in this case, it's a plot object. So you have a list of the data sets that are available in the plot object, meaning that they have been passed as one of these core scientific data model objects to the uh, to the plot object. And then you can then you can plot the the data in a window. So that's that's a basic uh, concept of a flow object. And then we have just started finding out which objects should we have. So uh, in this case, an example on a of a flow. It already looks a bit uh, busy. I recognize that. We start down here, twelve slash one. That's a Bruker experimental spectrum. And it's plotted over here in a plot. So you see there is a straight line over to the plot. Then it also goes up to this Simpson input file, which is a, a baseline correction, uh, uh, which is set up for baseline correction. Uh, and then we pass it, on to, pass it on to a fit that takes in some models. And then you can actually plot the, the, the experiment and the fit together. So the example here shows the, the simulation and the experiments overlaid by each other. In this case, it's, a, it's an experimental magic angle spinning, carbon-13 magic angle spinning spectrum of hexamethyl benzene. So you see the aromatic signal extending over many kilohertz, and then you see the methyl group just located down here at a few ppm. And then you see that when we fit the, the spectrum, uh, just the aromatic signal, we actually get a, a reasonable good fit, right? So this is one example on, on how you can use Simpson in combination with this uh, ECNMR flow-based setup. Now, one of the advantages that I have uh, appreciated in, uh, in uh, putting Simpson uh, on this online server is that there's only one platform to support and over the years, I've had many problems with the uh, uh, not well. On average, when we make a summer school, there'd be 80% of the people who manage to install Simpson and get it running on their own computers, and the last 20% they have some problems with the uh, old versions of the software. Sorry, old versions of the operating system or whatever problems uh, we can't solve. Uh, when we are on the summer school. We have run this uh, easy NMR version of Simpson on a couple of summer schools, and in this case, everybody was able to, to run it. So that's one of the advantages. There's only one place to update the code, and there's only one version uh, running. And then it's actually also using this kind of web-based uh, uh, sandbox server. You can actually also get away with running older operating system. So we can actually revive some of the old software that, that does not compile on, on modern uh, platforms. So actually, I also see this as a way of, uh, of uh, saving some of the science that was developed earlier on, if we can make it running on, on uh, one of our, one of our sand, sandbox servers, then we can uh, still make it available for people. And actually, our own program, SimMole, which is used to specify the spin system in, in biological macromolecules, that's one of these examples. Uh, we haven't been able to, to compile it on uh, modern platforms without rewriting the codes uh, quite substantially. So, so now we run it on a slightly older Linux version, and, and it, it runs in this virtual environment. So that's, that's a nice thing about it. An example here is that. Uh, we have an experimental spectrum. We can either plot it directly or we can do a Fourier transform and then plot the plot. In this case, it's a 2D spectrum. So that's a, that's a simple example. Another example that is that it, it, offers, uh, it offers a possibility of, uh, of uh, interacting with other uh, servers 
that are online. So we have a PDB object that can now load a PDB file. So if we type in the, the PDB ID, it goes to the server and it downloads, uh, in this case, the structure of Ubiquitin. And then you can uh, attach, for instance, a molecule viewer object so you can actually plot the object and so on and so forth. So this is one of uh, my recent uh, simulations where we have, uh, where we're doing a, a simultaneous uh, simulation of 14 different, well, maybe it's only 13 different uh, experimental spectra. I want, to, I want to simulate many different parameters at the same time. And in this case, we can just set it up and use this uh, calculate object which in which you just have to to write in the code in uh, in plain javascript and then you can actually do the simulation and, and choose what to plot and then we can feed in some parameters over down from this object so so it's really a, a nice workhorse and you can do whatever you like because it very is very versatile uh, we're trying to make it as as user friendly as possible obviously i shouldn't present this kind of data to, to you and saying that it's easy to make simulations. I, I, I fully am, I'm fully aware of that. But in this case, we have a simple NMR model object that just in this case takes two different spectra recorded at different magnetic field strengths. And I want to simulate both of them uh, using the same parameters. So for each of the spectra, I can add different models and, and then I can promote some of these parameters here associated with each model. We can promote them to global parameters that, that are linked between the models. So we can actually, for instance, fit the same CSA parameters at two different magnetic field strengths and so forth. So all of this is not, you know, it's not the complicated simulations, but the bookkeeping in, in making it uh, simple and intuitive for other, for other uh, users is, uh, is where we put the effort here. So user friendliness. And then finally, what I, what I really like and find the most useful actually is that uh, if, if you want to implement your own line shape, in many cases this is difficult because then you need to, then you need to establish uh, routines to load in uh, spectra and you need to be able to visualize everything and so on. But in this case, you see that you can just choose a custom model where you uh, create a function that reads in the x values. So x is an array of uh, x values, and then it reads in some parameters, and then you have to return the y values. If it's a one-dimensional model, if it's a two-dimensional, or let's say two-dimensional spectrum, then you, then you have x and y as input, and then you return set. So, so it's actually very easy also to you know, read a paper that has uh, described the line shape of uh, whatever uh, uh, model, and then you can just implement it right away here. You don't have to worry about input, uh, input and export and so on and so forth. So we are still uh, trying to converge on which uh, model should be, uh, which flow object should be there. Uh, we are, um, developing the software in a manner that you can easily, when you have made a workflow, you can easily save the workflow file, put it on the web as we have done, or send it to other people such that they can, they can work on the workflow, the simulation and the experiments at the same time. So you can share the exact same uh, setup uh, and you can also develop your own either uh, calculations or your own uh, up flow objects. So, so we hope to be able to publish this within the next half year or so, and, and uh, we have uh, good expectations to that. Now, I want to give you a few examples on uh, simulations that we have come across over the past uh, couple of years. So uh, optimum control is something that, that keeps uh, coming back from time to time. I already talked, uh, talked a bit about when you want to make selective excitation in imaging. Uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we also worked on improving the MQMAS uh, excitation efficiency. And it actually worked quite well, but uh, I kept having a small frustration at that time. And that was that, uh, so I should say that the pulse 
that you, we use for the excitation looks like this. And uh, the efficiency is shown up here and comparing to, to 200 kilohertz, which is down here is only uh, roughly half of it. So, so it is actually very efficient. But one of the problems is that, uh, so typically you simulate hundreds or thousands of optimum control pulse sequences and then try them, try them experimentally. Uh, you take out the best ones and then try them experimentally. And I must say that considering how well we normally are able to fit uh, or to match the experiment simulations in, in solid state NMR, I've been a bit disappointed about the, the agreement or lack of agreement between experiment and simulation. So we had a lot of promising candidates from simulations that didn't work as well uh, experimentally. So the hypothesis we had was that phase transients of these uh, rapidly oscillating pulse sequences here, they would, uh, they would actually, uh, so not, well, not kill the, the signal, but well, yeah, they, they would mean that what we calculate is not what we actually get at the, at the sample. So because of the phase transients, they, they change the appearance of the pulse sequence. And since uh, it's well known that, that phase transients, they, they come in, in different shapes and uh, appearances depending on the hardware setup, it's actually not so easy to just include phase transients in the, in the model. So we decided it's better to try to avoid phase transients at all, so, or limit the phase transients. So, so in normal, uh, using the Grave algorithm, for uh, optimum control, we just assume a piecewise pulse and then we optimize the amplitudes uh, of each pulse. Uh, so I was a bit quick in preparing this slide, so now I've made a, now I've made a complex uh, frequency, which is obviously not the case, so it, it should be understood as the X and Y phase of the pulse, okay, just to, just to remove any confusion. Uh, so instead of using this completely freely varying, uh, we just make a Fourier series. So, so making smooth series and then the basis set size n would define what the, uh, how fast the oscillations and thereby how many phase transients we would have. So we would assume that, that if we can get away with smaller basis sets, then we would get a better agreement. And just as the first, uh, demonstration, we actually, these are pure simulations. So you see that using grape, we get a certain transfer efficiency. Uh, using group, we can get the same when we get a, a reasonable uh, basis set size. And in this plot, you see that experimentally, it actually works very nice. So, so we actually get quite, uh, we get a, a better uh, experiment than we would do using using great. And then finally, because we had the assumption that this was this was due to the lack of phase transients and so on, we also tried to investigate, well, how good is the relation between the simulated uh, and experimental uh, precision, uh, well, uh, intensity. And in this case, we see that as long as the basis set is small, then we have a much better agreement than we do when we get up to the uh, rapidly changing pulses in the in the large basis sets and also using grape. So this somehow uh, proves our, our hypothesis, and we actually end up using uh, getting something that works better uh, for for uh, uh, gives a better transfer. So another thing we we like to use Simpson for is uh, pulse sequence optimizations or getting uh, getting insight into pulse sequences. So we have this uh, example, which is also part of the, the online tutorial. Let's assume that we want to make one of these uh, uh, experiments for biological samples where we have an N15 encoding and then we detect on carbon 13. In this case, uh, you have to, during T1 or for the CP, uh, DCP block here, you have to optimize the uh, transmitter carrier offset for the CP and also for the for this uh, post C7 uh, uh, homonuclear transfer step that you want to make. 
And in these cases, it's, it's fantastic just to simulate uh, the pulse sequence blocks and then uh, plot the relevant data because that gives you an insight that you can use when you, when you want to implement it on the spectrometer. So it limits the, it lim it limits the parameter space it, that you need to optimize experimentally. And then finally, going to something else, I, I talked about when you, when you in papers find a, a funny line shape like in this case, the classical, uh, you know, the classical exchange uh, line shape, which is uh, given up here. You also have, uh, uh, getting back to the question about methyl rotations, you can also find the uh, three state rotations and then, uh, then you can implement that. So whether it's, it's a simple liquid state on the mass spectrum, or if it's a deuterium exchange where you have two different, uh, quadrupolar frequencies, it's actually the same line shape that goes into it. So, so you can also simulate these funny line shapes relatively easy. In this case, we just implement this part in Simpson, and then we use Simpson's internal Hamiltonian to calculate the frequencies that we should plot in as new A and new B and, and so on and so forth. So uh, with this, I have come to the end. So I hope to have demonstrated that Simpson and all the other programs that I, that I talked about uh, mentioned briefly, they are very versatile and you can, you can use them for many different, uh, many different uh, kinds of simulations. And I choose to focus on Simpson because it takes some time to, to learn a program and uh, and uh, yeah, but once you become a, a wizard in, in your favorite simulation language, it turns out that anything is possible. So, so I mean, take the time. It's, it's actually worth it. And then I hope that uh, we'll be able to release this easy NMR, which makes it a lot easier to, to do the simulations uh, and to be as versatile as, as we already are. And then I think online storage of NMR spectra will uh, will change our way of, uh, of working with the data and sharing data and, and so on and so forth. And I'd like to acknowledge the people who have been involved in the, in the work. Anna Spudholt is, uh, uh, is uh, really uh, important in this work and I've enjoyed working with uh, Dominic, uh, Phil and Dipanj uh, on the online uh, or on the core scientific data model and then Zdenek Tusma from Prague who is always, uh, at least during the past 10 years, been very much involved in the Simpson developments. Uh, and then finally, I'd like to thank the, uh, the funding buddies, and I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, Sif and his collaborators for the invitation. Thank you, Thomas. So we have a few questions for you. So one of them is from me. Did you mention that we can now optimize Thomas, are you there? Yes, I am. Oh. <laughs> Did you mention that we can now optimize pulse sequence on Brooker topspin spectrometer? No, I didn't. Uh, well, uh, in, in the context I mean, of C7, in the well, context can... of C7 experiment, is it possible in now or in near future that one can do an optimization with the topspin? What kind of parameter should go into the experiment? Uh, so, so I mean, I don't know exactly what you mean by optimizing on the, in topspin because I mean that's what we do on the spectrometer. But, but you think uh, doing the simulations or, or that, like, uh, incorporating basically Simpson with the topspin and it can suggest you for this particular magnetic field or RF put this value for a particular pulse sequence. Yeah, so uh, I have been discussing that with Bruker, and it would be it would be very relevant to do that. Obviously, it has to be worked in for each pulse sequence uh, mm -hmm. because it uh, that's something we have also been been considering whether it would be possible to load in pulse sequences from Bruker and then do the simulations directly. I think that will be uh, well that will definitely not be very easy to do because there are so many different uh, parameters and, and, uh, and assumptions and phase cycling and so on that, that we don't need to do as a phase cycling uh, in Simpson, but we can just filter, filter the relevant parts of the, of the density operator. So it's not 
I think it's still, well, it, we're not ready to implement it in Topspin. I'd say it's still something you do on your, on your, uh, in your, at your desk, in your office, and then you go to the spectrometer with these parameters to, to do it. That's, that's the state right now, I'd say. Okay. So there's someone anonymous who wants to know, is it possible to implement relaxation in Simpson? Uh, so we are not right now working with the relaxation super operator. And mm -hmm. the reason why we have chosen not to implement that is that, that then you need to specify all the relaxation parameters for all uh, states and so on. And, and so we think it's at least that for us, it has not been uh, obvious to implement it in in the let's say in the analytical way or in the exact way uh, and then maintaining a relatively simple interface to to work with so right now it's it's more phenomenological like uh, line broadening and and then in some cases we we do add some uh, you know in the in the tcl environment so in the input file we also sometimes add an exponential decay of different uh, different components of the of the density operator. So so we have the possibility, but it's relatively handheld, I should say, right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Someone wants to know about the convention that is used for the Euler angle. What sort of convention is being used in Simpson? Is it flexible? No. It's not flexible. It's uh, defined in the original Simpson paper from 2000. Okay. And uh, I mean, right hand, I can't explain it uh, very well uh, right here. <laughs> yeah. But read the paper. Uh, then there is a good explanation. So, so Dell has a comment. He says the Yahoo group is no longer active. Will it be possible for you to create another forum for the discussion oh. of problems? Is, so uh, the, whew, the website works. I was in there earlier today and I have approved uh, users uh, last week or two weeks ago, but yeah, they haven't posted anything. So I, I'll look into that and then, uh, then definitely, yes, uh, we, should have a, we should have a forum. <laughs> so I, I'll make sure that it, that it works. I was not aware that it, it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Then someone uh, has a question. Uh, I would like to simulate the effect of proton and deuterium exchange at amide sites. Is there a way to implement it in Simpson? Yes, but again, it, it falls into the category that I called handheld before. So, uh, I mean, I, I have ideas on how to do it, but, but it would, I mean, it, it's not so it's not so simple uh, because you you would have to do some tricks uh, in uh, so the the idea is that or let's say the in this case the problem is that that Simpson uses uh, Hilbert space and then you have to sort of at the right point in your pulse sequence you have to read out the density operator and transform that into uh, operators and then uh, exchange the operators and then uh, change back to, to Hilbert space. So we've done that many times and there are examples of, of that in also in the tutorial paper, but it, it's, uh, let's say it definitely belongs to the advanced uh, category of experiment, but, but uh, yeah, well, I mean, we can discuss that uh, by email later eventually if you're interested in ideas. And then there is, we'll take one last question. So someone wants to know, is it possible to study overtone transitions for quadrupolar spins? Yes. And, and again, it, it would be a bit handheld. So it's a matter, you can control which, uh, you can control which uh, detect operators you use. 
and uh, so overtone i mean the hamiltonian is there the propagator is there so you can also calculate the detect operator so so i'd say it, it would be possible but uh, except if i just miss some obvious things about uh, overtones but but it, if you have the density operator you should have all you need to calculate the overtone shouldn't you? 